Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, and the gospel of today continues where we left off last week. The gospel of today is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. And as we start the fast, the church wants to remind us not to be worried about the material things, not to be worried about material things. Our Lord said, therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And I'm sure we could add a few more things that we're worried about to that list. But then our Lord, he says something very powerful. He says, after all these things, the... After all these things, that's what the... The Gentiles seek. Those are the things of the Gentiles. And today I want us to ask ourselves, are we Gentiles? Are we seeking after these things? Are we consumed with anxiety? Are we consumed with consumerism or materialism or desire for comfort? Because these things, those things are for the, the Gentiles. But we're not the Gentiles. We're the sons of the sons of God, the sons of a king. And the sons of God, they're not worried about those things. Unfortunately, these days, anxiety, like depression, very common in society. And even among the sons of God, even among the sons of God, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 40 million people, 40 million people are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And this is a chronic issue, and that's why today I want to speak about anxiety, anxiety. But before we get into the, that subject, I think we need some disclaimers, some disclaimers. Anxiety is healthy at a certain level. At a certain level, it's very beneficial. And I feel that like some people though, they're anxious about their anxiety. Their anxiety gives them more anxiety. And this is like a terrible like feedback loop. Like anxiety, I'm an anxious person, I become more and more anxious. And it's okay to be anxious about some things. It's okay. But our anxiety should have limits. It should have borders. And God gave us, like why did God allow us to feel this emotion of anxiety? He gave us this emotion or this feeling so that we could be motivated, so that it would motivate us to change. Like for example, without an exam, who would study if there wasn't an exam? Until you would study without an exam? No, and I had to study because of the exam. So the exam motivates me to, to study. Some people that doesn't motivate them, but that's not good. And similarly, without a judgment day, without Judgment Day, like Judgment Day is supposed to motivate us to repentance. That anxiety of Judgment Day standing before the just judge and him seeing my whole life, this should inspire me to, to repent, to change. But the problem is that this emotion, which is supposed to drive me to change and is supposed to drive me, to, is supposed to motivate me, now this emotion doesn't motivate me, it paralyzes me. It paralyzes me. And this is a big issue. This is a big sickness which we need to address. And the good, the, the good news about this sickness of anxiety is that anxiety is highly, highly, highly treatable. Highly treatable. And that's not just my words. It's not even just the Bible's words because that should, like some people, they don't trust that. It's actually the words of the association of anxiety and depression, the one, the same association. If you go to their website, it says on their website, it says that anxiety disorders are highly treatable. Highly, highly treatable. So I don't know why we don't believe that this stuff is treatable these days. Even the website itself, like the people, the, they say it's treatable. The question, though, for us is, are we willing to be treated? Are we willing to be cha like change the way we think? Are we willing to change the way we perceive our surroundings? Are we willing to seek help from the counselors, the therapists, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, our father of confession? Or we just want to go and take a little pill and then make us feel better? I mean, th that's like medication has its purpose and has its, and, and has its use. But that's not the only treatment. 
And I would encourage anyone who has anxiety to address it, to treat it comprehensively through all the means necessary. Today, I want to speak to you about three causes of anxiety. Three causes of anxiety. The first cause of anxiety is that because we're so dramatic these days. We're so dramatic these days. And we blow everything out of proportion, way out of propor proportion. And I was thinking about it, life, that is so simple. Actually, the necessities of life are very, like, hackable seat get them. Like, everything is so easy. All we need in this life is to worship God. We work a little bit, and we have a good family. And hey, kid, best. That's life. Life does, kid, that's it. But what happens is we make the issue very complicated. And I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I, need, and I do this, and I need this, and we have mashakil, and do this. And we've turned something, life is supposed to be so easy, just focus on Rabbana, enjoy the liturgy, live in the church, we are open all day, you can come live here, we have everything here. But we make life so complicated, we make life so, so complicated. And then this, and then we wonder why we're anxious people. Ahna, we do it to ourselves. Another reason, you know, like to show how dramatic we are, and I was thinking about this the other day, is like, and I send a text and some people didn't respond, and I know this happens all the time, I do this to people all the time, and the whole time I'm thinking, oh man, they're not responding, they don't like me. Hmm, why aren't they, they must, and they must hate me. Oh, is it because I offended them? And then we start playing all the kisses and, and all the, they're just busy, like people are just busy, they didn't respond the second they saw, it's okay. Because we make kiss like, we're so dramatic, sah? And this kills, like, makes us so dramatic. And I think part of this reason that we are so dramatic is because we have underlying pride. Underlying pride. It doesn't manifest on the outside as pride, but on the inside, it's pride. It's pride, for sure. Masalan, yesterday, we were attending, in, I was attending an ordination in Indiana, and there was priests and a bishop, and we're all sitting in the, in the, the altar room, and Sayyidina is about to bless our tonyas. I look down, and I see there's a little hole on the top of my sock, a little hole, and I get like so embarrassed, so embarrassed. I was like, oh, I have a hole. And then I'm like starting, oh my, everyone's going to make fun of me and everyone. And I, so I slip my foot under the galabaya, kida, and the whole liturgy, and I'm standing kida, and then I'm, and I'm trying to cover my hole. And then I realize, kida, and I'm in a church of a thousand people. You think they're going to be concerned about my, the hole in my sock? And then I, I think, I, and no one's looking at the hole in your sock. And then I thought to myself, did you notice anybody's socks today? And I was like, no, I didn't notice anyone's socks. I didn't look, and I was standing in the room. I didn't notice anyone's socks. So why do I think everyone is looking at my, my sock, my hole? And I feel like because we're so dramatic and we're so self-centered, and I'm so self we're like we think everybody is looking at the hole in our life, and everyone is sitting there. Ooh, you have a hole in your sock, and you and you and and and, and it's just Anna dramatic. We're so dramatic. And I think this is, as I said, a hidden form of pride. Hidden form of pride. No one really cares about your socks. Really. No one cares. No one's looking at the socks. No one looked at my sock yesterday. It's all just in my head. I'm just playing this in my head. And I think these days, we have many insecurities. Many, many insecurities. And we feel everyone is watching them. Like, head is like sitting there looking at your insecurities and watching them and eyeing them down. And, but no one's looking at your insecurities. Everybody is for their own mashakil and they have their own worries. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Sufficient and everyone has their... No one's looking at your... So don't be too dramatic. Another way we become dramatic, another way we become very dramatic, is in regards to our sin in regard to our sins. I feel many people these days, they want to be better. They want to change, they want to repent, but their past is preventing them. They see their past as disqualifying them from the church. They feel unworthy, they feel that they must live up to their old reputation. Their old reputation. So in essence, this person doesn't forgive themselves. And I feel like many people these days are scared to let grace enter their life. Very scared to let grace enter their life. We lived a certain way for so long. 
We lived a certain way for so long, so we got used to living this way. And, and to change, to do something new, that's, that's, that causes anxiety. <laughs> to do something new that you haven't done before, that causes someone to be a little like uncomfortable. So people want to change, they want to do better, but they, don't, they aren't willing to do something a little bit new because that makes them anxious. And I feel a lot of people, Masan, I was talking to someone the other, a long time ago, whatever, said, why can't you like, come and attend the Bible study? They said, Abuna, don't attend these things. I said, you can. No, no, no. I said, why not? You can. You can do it. No, no. Stuck. And they don't attend any any far from the, like, the church. But they can. But it's just feel a little bit of anxiety that they just need to like, get over. But people think their past disqualifies them from their, from their future. And I think in a few weeks, we're going to study the gospel of the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman, she could have said, I have a big hole in my sock. <laughs> I had five husbands. I, I'm not qualified to preach. No one likes me in this city. And I don't want to do, like, why would anyone trust me or listen to me? But she went out regardless, and she, do you think she was a little anxious when she was speaking to people? I think she was like, Khalas, I don't care. I forget, that's in the past. That was the old Samaritan woman. Now I am a new person. Jesus Christ made me new. So I think we shouldn't be too dramatic. Okay? Let's not be dramatic. Number two, the second cause of anxiety in our life, lack of preparedness. Lack of preparedness. I believe we have become more anxious because we've become more distracted and less focused. Less focused. So we are not able to finish the things that are required of us, and this leaves us feeling unprepared. And when you feel unprepared, you will be anxious. Yanni, when you're prepared for an exam, you feel much better than when you are unprepared. And by prepared, I mean you have done your part. You have done the best that you can do. And I feel like this is what God wants from us. He wants us to offer our best to Him. And this is something I want to ask of you, students. Do you do the best for your teachers? You should. You should do the best that you can do. And you might think this will make you anxious to do the best, but actually you'll be more anxious by not doing your best. Because you'll think, and you'll think to yourself, man, I could have done better. I wish I did this. I wish I did this. I wish I did this. And oh, I'm a failure. And then, it, then you start playing that cycle in your head, and then, and then you're gonna be like lost into this field of anxiety and depression. But the ones who offer their best, they feel that they've given everything that they've got. And then they feel at peace. And that's why employees, I would encourage you to do the best for your employers, to do the best for your employers. Do the best in every circumstance that you can. Be the best, at, at, do your best at everything that you can. And then you do your part and let God do his part. Let God do his part. The Lord taught us many times to be watchful, to be prepared for Judgment Day. Because the one who is prepared, he will not be anxious to meet the Lord. <laughs> he actually, he wants to go meet the Lord. He's anxious to go meet the Lord, not anxious for the Lord to come. And that's why the Lord said, I'm coming like a thief in the night. So the thief in the night, what should you do? You should be prepared. You should be watchful. If you're not watchful, you'll be like the five virgins. What were they doing? They were sleeping. And then when they were sleeping, the bridegroom came, and then they said, we don't have oil. Where are we going to get oil? We need to go find oil. I don't know where the oil's from. Where's the market? Is the market closed? It's not open. And then, oh, anxiety. And uh, because they're not, they're not prepared. So to be prepared, this will remove anxiety. Be prepared. The third cause of anxiety is our love for temporary things, our love for temporary things. In accounting, assets, they can be considered either appreciating or depreciating. And there are some assets that tend to increase in time, like your house tends to appreciate in time. 
And there's some assets that depreciate in time, like your car, like a brand new car. You buy a brand new car, within the first year, it's lost 20% of its value without any, just, you, you took it off the lot, 20% gone. Why? But the value of the car, depreciating, depreciating. In the spiritual point of view, everything in this world is depreciating. Everything in this world is a depreciating asset. And that's why the Lord said, do not lay up for yourselves on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Nothing in this world lasts. Nothing in this world lasts. Nothing in this world endures. And I feel like we have anxiety. Why? Because we try to make something that doesn't last, we want it to last. And so we panic. Why is this thing not lasting? And I think if we changed our mind and we realized this thing's not lasting, it wouldn't bother us. Does it bother you that your car's depreciating or you just know it's depreciating and so into, you're happy. You go buy a new car, it depreciates and I'm happy, whatever. It's depreciating because we know it's depreciating and so we're not attached to it. We know in a few years the car does going to be biased and we'll get another one. We know it. So do you know that everything in this world is Depreciating, if you don't know, you should know now, <laughs> because these days, inflation, money is depreciating. Money is depreciating. Everything is losing its value. Everything is losing its value. The people in Russia, their currency dropped in the past 11 days or whatever, 30%. So imagine you're in Russia and you have a bank account. It's gone, 30% gone. Keda, gone. And imagine you're the people of Ukraine, a million people displaced from their house. They have nothing now, nothing. Their homes, their possessions, their everything gone to move to a new place, like a huge humanitarian crisis. But why? Because thieves broke in and stole. That's what the Bible says. The thieves do not lay up for treasures on earth because thieves break in and steal. So everything is, go is going, everything is gone, everything is going. And that's why the Bible teaches us not to be attached to the things of this world. Not to be attached to the things of this world. That's why God told Abraham, you need to move and leave to the promised land. If Abraham said, no, I'm attached here, I don't want to go, okay. No promise, you are not the man of faith. If Lot said, you know, the angel said, leave this place. This place is sinful. Leave it. There's nothing good for you here. And Lot got up and left. He left his house. He left his people. He left his land. And he got up and left because he's not attached to his belongings. But Lot's wife, eh, she's attached to him. And she couldn't leave. And so God dealt with her. Look at what Solomon says in his wisdom in the Proverbs. He says, be wise enough not to wear yourself out trying to get rich. Do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Your money can be gone in a flash as if it had grown wings and had flown away like an eagle. And St. Augustine, in his commentary on this gospel, he says something very beautiful. He says, if someone does something with the intent of gaining earthly profit, that one's heart is upon the earth. That person's heart is upon the earth. How can a heart be clean when it is in the mud of the earth? St. Augustine says, how can your heart be clean if your heart is in the mud of the earth? He says, on the other hand, if it is fastened upon heaven, if your mind and your heart is in heaven, then your heart will be clean and unpolluted. He says, a thing becomes defiled. A thing becomes defiled when it is debased with something that is less valuable. He says, like, if you take gold and you mix it with silver, you've ruined the gold. You've mixed it. You've polluted it. You've, if you add copper, if you add all these other, you pollute the copper. And he says, our heavenly mind should be fastened to heaven. And when we become attached to the things of this earth, we are polluting our hearts, polluting them. They are polluted. 
So today, the gospel is saying, don't be attached to the things of this world. And if you are not attached to the things of this world, then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. This is the peace of God, but we have to be detached from, from the world. We need to have faith in God. We need to have faith in God. I want to close with one story that I, I read these days, or a few days ago. It was about a lecture, and he was giving um, a lecture to his students, and he told one of the students to raise a glass of water. So he raised a glass of water, and he said, how heavy is this glass of water? And the student said, it's like one pound, whatever. And he said, okay, just keep holding the glass. And eventually, the thing that was so light became very heavy, very, very heavy. And it could, he couldn't carry something even very light. And I feel this is what the world, like, we are carrying something light, but we're trying to carry it on our own. And if we carry it on our own, guess what? You can't carry it. You're gonna get tired. You're gonna wear out. You're gonna burn out. You're gonna get exhausted. You're gonna say, it's too much. I can't, I, I'm anxious, uh, I can't. And all the stuff that we hear all the time. But the key is not, you're not supposed to hold it by yourself. You have the helper, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants to carry it with you. Carry the cross and he carried a cross. He wants to carry it with you. So don't carry the glass by yourself. Don't carry your problems by yourself. Trust in God. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, he ended this passage. He says, why do you worry about your clothing? He says, look at the lilies of the field. I, they're so beautiful. Why are you worried? Why are you worried? Trust in God. We need to become people of faith. Faith removes anxiety. Faith removes anxiety. If you are a people of faith, then it will take and calm your anxiety. Today we talked about three things about anxiety. We said, don't be too, don't be too, Dramatic, don't be too dramatic. Number two, be prepared, be prepared. And three, don't be attached, don't be attached. And then we can allow the peace of God to, get, to guard our souls and minds. And glory be to God forever, amen. Nathaniel.